and Cheryl. Cheryl and Carol. Carol and Cheryl. Welcome back to Conversations with Carol and Cheryl. Hi, Carol. Hey, Cheryl. And hi, Nancy, our special guest today. Hi, Carol and Cheryl. Welcome to the show. Um, you want to let our listeners know what you do? Sure. So I'm going to tell you uh, just a little bit about my background and how I got to do what I'm doing now. Um, but the website that I work with now is called Corner of the Sky. And I named it that. It's actually a, a song from a musical called Pippin, where he's trying to find his corner of the sky. So the hope is that everyone through this mindfulness and yoga practice will be able to find their corner of the sky and everybody's corner of the sky might be a little bit different. You know, I have one child whose corner of the sky is definitely hiking and rock climbing and I, I have another one who loves to run. And so everyone's corner of the sky might be a little bit different, but it's kind of how we go about it. And I think the mindfulness portion in particular can be a part of everybody's corner of the sky. So I'll go way back to how I started, which has nothing to do with yoga and mindfulness. As you know, we just kind of mature into different aspects of life as we go along and, and take some other path and end up somewhere where we never thought that we would be. And a lot of that, I think, has to do with just what life brings us and what we learn from life. Um, but I started as a performing artist, and I was kind of a struggling student in high school, probably, honestly, ADHD before ADHD was a thing, if that tells you how old I am, <laughs> back before anyone was diagnosed with anything like that, but always struggled to sit and pay attention and that kind of thing. And so I found dance, and a lot of dance, I think, relates to yoga in that it's that same like movement and breath together. And so for me, it was a great outlet. So I started dancing more and more and more and ended up going for four years high school for my last two years of high school. Um, and it was on a junior college campus. And I did struggle a little bit as an 11th grader in the college uh, academic courses, but I was able to dance a lot of the day. Uh, and there was a lot of performing involved, which I loved. And I wanted to go and apprentice in a company, but my parents are very academic. And so they seemed to think I needed to go to college. <laughs> so I went on to college. I quit dancing my freshman year and tried to just absorb the academics. And I really struggled just sitting all day. So I ended up auditioning for the dance department. And now it's a school of dance. I went to a school that happens to have very, very good arts. I went to Florida State University and all of the arts there are very good um, and ended up getting into the dance department and then dancing for the rest of my time in college. Then I got an internship. I had thought I might go into arts administration. So I was so blessed to get an internship at the Kennedy Center, which happens to be one of my favorite places on earth. And so I went to the Kennedy Center to intern in arts education, thinking that I would go into arts administration. But what I soon found from talking to people is that I could go back to school and probably make less than minimum wage working in arts administration. But I love DC. So I ended up staying in DC. Of course, I ended up meeting my husband who was from here and ended up staying here. Somehow ended up planning special events and worked for the YMCA. Then I worked for the Muscular Dystrophy Association, planning special events. And a lot of that was out and about. So I was kind of okay at that. A lot of it's coordinating in the office, but we were out driving and meeting people all the time. So I was kind of okay with that. Somewhere along the lines of when I was thinking I might want to transition into something else, a high school friend of mine called and said, I really thought of you Today, my daughter just signed up for dance classes through her daycare, and she lived in Texas. So I might be a little impulsive. So I hung up the phone, and I walked into my husband. I go, like, I am quitting my job tomorrow. I'm going to start this business. I'm going to go into daycares and teach dance. He's much more of a realist than I am. <laughs> he said, maybe you should see if somebody wants you to come in and 
teach dance before you quit your job. So I literally took the next day off, which was a Monday. I spent two days cold calling, which I was pretty good at by that point because I was doing special event fundraising. So I was pretty good at calling people. I lined up some schools and I quit my job the next week. Literally the next week. Right. (laughs) Sometimes life just takes you in a weird way. I had a gut feeling it was going to work. And there's so many daycares and I love working with children. Like it's kind of a passion of mine anyway. And I love young children. So I kind of had a feeling it was going to work. Well, I ended up signing on a huge chain of daycare centers. So immediately I had to hire people and it turned into such a big thing so fast. And as you live and learn, I ended up cutting back to kind of what I could teach. And at different times I would have one or two teachers helping me, but Um, Mostly, I just taught what I could teach. I should also mention that I quit my job. And the next week, I found out I was expecting my first child. (laughs) So, Oh, my God. I all this as I was expecting my first child. I don't know. It was a tumultuous kind of time in my life, but really kind of fun and adventurous, too. And I loved teaching the kids. What I didn't love and what I didn't love in my corporate job was overseeing adults. So when I had to hire the teachers, I found they were kind of undependable. I don't know. Maybe they didn't show up where they were supposed to be. And so I was always having to go back and cover their classes. So I ended up, as I had the first child, cutting back to mostly what I could teach. And I found that was really manageable. I loved the kids. It was extra income. I only had to leave her for a few hours each week to teach because here's the great thing about teaching preschoolers, they nap at noon. So you really only have a small window of opportunity to teach. It's like nine to noon. So I would go to different schools each day. And sometimes if the schools were close together and I only had one or two classes, I could make it to second center and do one or two classes. But that was a great fit for me. I loved it for many years. I will say this. Up until COVID, I was still teaching at several of the centers I started teaching at 29 years ago. Wow. Oh, a lot of years. Inspirational. How? This is amazing. A couple of my kids went through college and became teachers at the school where I taught them preschool when they were three. (laughs) I've seen a lot of them come through. Yeah. And lots of siblings. It was really fulfilling and awesome. And parents were really understanding Through the process, I had four pregnancies, three births. I had lost one baby at one point, but parents were so understanding. The parents of preschoolers, if I had to reschedule because a child had an ear infection, because we were kind of all in it together. So it was a great fit for having young kids. So I did that for, I don't know, almost 30 years. (laughs) I should say for a good portion of that, up and through my till my second child was about two or three, I was still performing with several different um, local companies. I was still dancing myself at that point. I don't know, by the time you have three, the body doesn't really bounce back that well. (laughs) And, And I was getting older, so I was needing to find some kind of exercise that fit my lifestyle, and I, love to dance, but a lot of exercise really isn't my jam. I don't like to run. My feet are turned out like a ballet dancer. I look like a duck trying to run. And I was trying different kinds of fitness classes and nothing was really resonating with me. And so I ended up going to a yoga class in my gym, just looking for something. Well, a lot of the movement kind of relates to dance. And like I said, it's a lot of it is the breath with movement that's so beneficial And they cue the breath. And I was, oh, this I love. So as I was doing that for a couple of years, I was thinking, I would love to teach this in some form. But as you all probably know, because you have children, you spend a lot of time driving them around. Like there wasn't a lot of time to fit in. You have to do a 200-hour training to be certified to teach. So for many years, I couldn't figure it out. how to add one more thing to my plate teaching and running the kids around. Cut to maybe 2017, my children were all driving at that point, which is huge. 
So I wasn't needed quite as much because they could drive themselves to a lot of their activities. So I finally found a little window of opportunity to do my teacher training. And I did that with a um, yoga studio out here where I live. And then I started teaching just an adult class a week. And I started adding a little bit of yoga into my preschool classes. And about that time, my kids were older and I was looking around and talking to other parents and I was starting to notice the anxiety level of teenagers and where it touches my heart that they're such stressed out people. And even the difference between my oldest and my youngest, which is about eight years, when cell phones became a real thing and social media became a real thing, you can see the increase in anxiety. And I don't know the studies, but I would also guess a bit of depression. And about that time, we also, out where I live, which is Loudoun County, had a string of high school suicides. <sighs> Sorry. It touches my heart a lot. So I was feeling for these teenagers, and I'm thinking, well, there's this song by Matthew West. Do you know Matthew West? He's a, he's a Christian singer, so not a lot of people know him. But there's this song that he sings called Do Something, which I love. And he's saying, like, I woke up this morning and the world's full of trouble. And I shook my fist at heaven and I said, God, why don't you do something? And he said, I did. I created you. So what does a dance major <laughs> with a yoga certification, what, you know, I was thinking, what can I do? But in the meantime, I had started studying mindfulness. And mindfulness goes side by side, I think, with yoga a lot. And mindfulness is really just kind of being really aware in the present moment and bringing yourself to the present moment. And it many times involves meditation. But what we found is that when we come into the present moment, the present moment a lot of times is okay. And what brings us anxiety is looking in the past and worrying or thinking about the future and worrying about the future. So how can we bring our mind into the present? As I'm studying that, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like how do we teach teens this? How to bring their minds into the present? So I found a teen yoga training and I went to Yogaville for a week. That's a thing, Yogaville. And it's a- Where is that? It's in, um, it's not far from Charlottesville. It's a beautiful ashram and it's where they meditate. Swami Satchitananda started it. Anyway, where you do your meditations there, it's kind of for all religions and all religions are represented. So wherever you're sitting, you can see a different religion um, represented across from you. It's really a cool place. And they have all kinds of trainings there. And people actually live there. And you can go for retreat as well. So I did a week-long certification for teaching teens. Well, what I found with teaching teens is I was teaching them a lot like adults. Put your mats in a line. Well, they teach them in a circle. And I love that. So it creates connection right away. So you're sitting in a circle. When you teach the teens, there's a lot of gameplay involved so that there's connections. There's yoga for strengthening, but also I would teach them some of the mindfulness and some of the breathing activities. And so I came back and I started a class through uh, where I go to church. There's a ministry that's more spiritual called Imagine Ministry. It's through the church, but a bit separate from the church. And so I started teaching these teen class through the Imagine Ministry. And so the teens, they're awesome and they loved it but they're very fickle. So some weeks you have a lot of teens and some weeks you have very few teens. And um, so I found that eventually I was teaching them more in segments of like four weeks so they can kind of commit to four weeks. And we might do four weeks on balance or four weeks on energy. And then I thought, we need to learn some of these skills younger than this age, but they need this in middle school. They're already stressed. They're already anxious. And then I thought, oh, by middle school, 
you need to know these things already and they need to kind of be in your body because it's hard to talk middle schoolers into trying something new sometimes. We need to teach it in elementary school. And then I thought, oh my goodness, why am I not just teaching this to my preschoolers? Because I think if they start the practices that young, when they feel stressed, they're going to know what to do. You're not having to teach it to them. They'll go back and do it. So I started teaching it in my preschools and oh my goodness, they're so willing to try anything. They are the most open group of people, these little people. They'll have their eyes closed. They're doing just whatever you ask them, which is wonderful. So I've been teaching it younger and younger and kind of led me now to develop this product, which I'll tell you about in just a bit. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about mindfulness. Is that cool with you guys? Yeah, please. Yes. So I think we'll do a, a little short exercise and I'll talk through it. So maybe the listeners could even try it too. And it would be about a minute or, or two. So come to a comfortable seat and bring your shoulders over your hips. So sit up nice and tall and maybe even take the back of your head and kind of lift it up and back. So we have our shoulders over our hips and kind of your belly's engaged and you have really nice tall posture. And then take your feet and place them on the floor and really start to feel the ground beneath your feet so that you really feel the support of the ground beneath your feet and start to notice your seat in the chair and notice how that support feels. And then if you're comfortable, you can close your eyes and place your hands in your lap. And if you're able, start to breathe through your nose Inhaling and exhaling. Notice your face and see if you can release some tension in your face, especially notice that area between your eyes. Sometimes we hold tension there. Notice the jaw and maybe bring the teeth apart a little bit, but you can keep the lips sealed and release the jaw and release that area right behind the ears, relaxing the face, continue breathing through the nose. And then take one hand and place it on your belly and it doesn't matter which hand. And take the other hand and place it over your heart. And as you're breathing through the nose, see if you can breathe into that hand on the belly, into the belly, letting the belly expand as you inhale, and then it will fall as you exhale. And again, inhaling into the belly, and exhaling. Maybe one last time, inhaling, and exhaling. And then noticing the hand on the heart, See if you can breathe air into that hand, into the heart. And of course, we're still breathing into the lungs, but we're just using that visual cue of breathing into the heart. So your chest may rise as you inhale and the chest may fall as you exhale. And then we'll put those together. So we'll inhale into the belly and then continue inhaling and let that heart rise as well. So you have a nice full breath of air. And then as you exhale, release from the heart first and then the belly. And then inhaling into the belly and the heart. Releasing from the heart and the belly. Keep your hand on your heart and belly. Just let your breathing return to normal. If you're able, breathing through the nose. Keeping the eyes closed, let the hands fall into the lap and take two more breaths. And then slowly notice how you feel. And you can blink the eyes open. And I'm wondering how that was for you guys. Very good. I feel more relaxed even after just a minute. 
So some of that's grounding and centering. And when we bring our mind to the breath, and there's all different kinds of breath work that you can do, it brings us to the here and now. And it calms and centers us. So you can imagine students before a test or day-to-day life, they start to get so stressed out if they have some centering practice like that. And there's a lot of different ones that you can do. Let's do one more that I like to do. So I've done some test prep work as well. And these are, I teach these to preschoolers and they can do them. And they're actually in the product that I offer, but um, they're part of the breathing practice that's offered there. But there's a few of them that I really like to do even for older kids because they use the hands. So they're tactile, but there are things that you could do under a desk. So that if you were feeling super stressed out before a test, you could do these breathing practices and no one would see and no one would know. And what happens when we get really anxious is that um, sympathetic nervous system, that fight, flight, or freeze comes into action. And it's the amygdala, this little tiny reptilian part of the brain, like the early run from the tiger part of the brain that's activated when we're super anxious like that. What's happened in our, well, goodness, before I would say pre-COVID life, but probably even more so now, is that we're in that sympathetic nervous system more and more and more all the time. And that's what causes that stress and anxiety where you feel like that a lot of the day. And if we don't stop and take a breath and learn to relax consciously, it wreaks havoc on our body to be like that and not to mention our mind and our psychological state to be like that all of the time. So what we want to do is get out of that amygdala, the prefrontal cortex, which we know in teenagers isn't really truly developed. They need to get into that part of the brain, especially for test taking. If they're in that amygdala and in that fight, flight, or freeze, and they're getting ready to take a test, they're not able to use that thinking part of their brain. And so we want to turn that off. So what I should also say is they don't work at the same time. So if we're in that fight, flight, or freeze, we can't even activate that prefrontal cortex. So we need to get out of that and get into that parasympathetic nervous system. And the parasympathetic nervous system, we call it rest and digest. You're just able to think better and you're much calmer. So we'll do one breathing exercise that they could do under a desk. And so hold your palm out in front of you very wide. And then it doesn't matter which hand, take the other hand and just stick up your pointer finger and we'll put it into our palm. And we're gonna basically draw circles in our palm and you'll feel the circle. But as we inhale, and you'll take a nice long inhale, it doesn't matter how long, you'll draw circles clockwise. And then as you exhale, draw the circle the other way. So inhale clockwise and exhale counterclockwise. Inhale clockwise, exhale counterclockwise. And then we always take a second to place our hands in our lap. Take a big breath in and a big breath out and notice how you feel. And so the hope is that they would be able to do that under their desk. There's another one that's great that's, I call it starfish breathing, and you trace the hand so you would inhale as you go up each finger or thumb. So you would inhale up and exhale down and it slows down your breathing because it takes you a little while to trace those fingers of the starfish. But that could also be done under a desk. But I love the ones that can be done under a desk. And honestly, I always say for kids, but really, if you're an adult that's about to make a presentation, what's it going to hurt for you to take a couple of breaths and do that? And I think using the hands, it offers another sense, that sense of touch. And it also reminds you to slow down because it takes you a second to do that. Does that sense of touch like pull your brain away from your other thoughts, right? Because you're focusing on this or you're seeing? I don't know that I've actually researched or studied that, but I will say for me, it does. And because I'm a movement person, for me, 
the more movement I can have that goes with something that reinforces it. It took it away from me. Thing to bring you into the present. The same thing with your feet. Now, I do know there's been a study that says that teachers that have their students place their feet on the ground, take a deep breath, wiggle their toes and feel the ground beneath their feet. It's really grounding for them before tests. And I have read a study and I don't have it written in my notes that says that kids perform better on tests with that bit of grounding. What a great way to take two seconds before a test or before a presentation if you're an adult to ground a little bit. The first thing that came to my mind when you said that, it's almost like being out in the ocean and you have nothing to grasp. As soon as you grab that life raft, you feel hope and you feel steady. You're out of that stage where you think there's no help or where you have no control. And I've heard this the metaphor of, of an anchor too. And when you drop that anchor, you're more stable. And so we know that life is going to whirl us all over the place. I think especially at my age and anyone that has maybe teenagers, life is going to whirl you a little bit, you know? I mean, younger kids as well, I think they whirl you physically, but I think somehow teenagers and adult children can whirl you mentally, you know? But if we can find that even as adults, that grounding and centering, we may wobble a little bit, but we come back to that balance so much quicker. And I found since I've been studying yoga and mindfulness and doing it myself, I've had some really whirling situations in my life and I do get tossed around, but I come back to center much quicker than I think I used to. If I can share it with people, maybe it will help. I always say young people because they're kind of my jam, but really it helps adults too. And so the best way to do these practices, especially if you have young kids, is to do it with them. I would venture to say, and I would guess that the adults that are doing it with them are likely to find some benefit too. Absolutely. These are some really easy techniques and tools for calming. It's so easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me laugh a little bit knowing myself when you say meditation. Almost everyone, when I say, do you meditate? People are like, what? No way. Have you ever heard Kelly Ripa talk about meditating? No way could I ever meditate. I can't sit still. But I love when people say that to me because I'm like the epitome of like, if somebody shouldn't be able to meditate, it should be me. But there's a woman named Kira Wiley who's awesome and she works with kids and she calls it bite-sized mindfulness for kids. So 10 minutes. A lot of times still use the Calm app, which I love. I've used a lot of apps. I like Headspace. I personally really love the Calm app. And so I try to meditate every morning, at least 10 minutes, go in and do it right when I get up. I can do 10 minutes. I can do more, but the sitting still is a challenge for me. What people think is they think you meditate and your mind is supposed to be clear as crystal and you can sit quietly for hours. But really what meditation is, is that mindfulness piece, like bringing your mind back to the breath, bringing it back to the breath, bringing it back to the breath with kindness and compassion. And that's sometimes the hard part is the kindness and compassion, especially for ourselves. So if you're meditating, some days your mind is all over. And every time you notice it going away and you bring it back, that's meditating. So we call it practice, a meditation practice because we're really just practicing all the time. And there's no perfect way to do it. And if you're breathing, you're doing it right. And if you notice your mind wandering, you're doing it even more right, <laughs> you know? But some days I'll sit for 10 minutes and bring my mind back a hundred times. And then some days you're more successful and you're able to focus on your breath. <laughs> That's good to know that that is meditation because I always thought I was doing it wrong because my mind was wandering. I thought I was going to get in this state where I almost got um, zen like. I was expecting to reach another state. So I find now that I have, when I've done that, I have meditated correctly. So that's, oh, that's yeah. nice to know that that's what it is. And there's no wrong way to do it. So, Nancy, what's the funniest thing a kid has ever said to you in one of your classes? 
Oh my goodness. Let me think. They're just so humbling. Many times in my fluffiness, they'll say, you have a baby in that belly? <laughs> I'm like, uh, no, Miss Nancy's too old to have a baby. <laughs> it's my food, baby. That's left over. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. They will tell you exactly what they see and think, you know. Yes. I love that about them, though. And mm-hmm. because it's always in such innocence. Well, should I show you my product? Kind yes. of exist. I should say my website, my website is cornerofthesky.love. Dot love. Isn't that so much better? Yeah. So cornerofthesky.love. And I have a bit about um, the different kinds of classes I teach the kids in motion class, which is the movement class. I also teach yoga to teens and kids and adults during my regular life. I'm starting back an outdoor class this week because I haven't been teaching. The Zoom really wasn't my thing developed a classic really could be even in the corporate world. It's called reconnect, like reconnect our head, heart and body, reconnect to each other, reconnect ages. I was doing it through this Imagine ministry as well. And it has every age, it's intergenerational and it has preschool to senior citizens and they work together and there's a gameplay kind of like the teens. I usually do some kind of non-competitive interactive game We do either art or service project. One time we did sticky notes um, with thumbprints that said like the children wrote you are kind or people wrote you are kind and they could stick them around. And then we do a little bit of group yoga and some meditation. So I call that reconnect. But what I also have on my website is called Calm in a Box. And so it's a product I've developed for preschoolers, but really any age could use it. It's a small box. It would travel well, like could take it in a car. Uh, My idea is that it's to be used for peace corners or calm down corners. I like the word peace corners a bit better um, because we don't always want to calm our kids. Sometimes they need a little movement too, but um, for a peace corner in a school or in a home setting, especially as we're doing school at home. And so when we open the box, it's a bright colored box. It's in a nice bright blue and it has words all around like shine and love and peace and big bold letters. So pretty. I love it. Decorative. I did all the artwork myself. So what I have in the box, there's a bubble timer and the timer is great for kids. It's a visual for them to look at. And there's a activity that uses the timer in the box. And then there's a five minute timer and the five minute timer is for really for teachers or for parents to kind of keep an eye on time because we don't want it to be an escape. It's more of a brain break for the kids. And then who's my favorite? It's a weighted heart and it's in minky fabric. So it has a great feel. We were talking about how I like the tactile feel of things. I always like things to have more than one component. So this is weighted with the pellets. You would make a weighted blanket. So it has an insert in there with the weighted pellets so that it can be washed. And then we played with the weight and I'm really, really happy with the weight. And this is used for the belly breathing. When they lay on their back, instead of placing a hand on, they could place this on their belly. But I have it in a few homes and parents tell me that kids really like to carry it around too. It has a really great weight. You can place it on your lap. It gives a little weight. So I love the heart. And then also in the box are all of these cards. But so on the back, there's a description of the breathing practice. Like this one is candle breathing. So you hold your palm out and you inhale and then you gently blow out. You pretend there's a flame on each finger and you gently blow out the flame on each finger. And so on the back of the cards, and so you'll see there's a QR code and you can hold your phone up on the photo and then it pulls up a YouTube video. So the kids can hold it up or the parents can hold it up. And a YouTube video comes up with the breathing practice. There I am. It says today we're going to practice candle breathing. So every kid can pull them up, scan them, and they have a visual and they can talk through it. And my thought is after they've done that a few times, they're going to be able to look at the card and they're going to know what it is. But there's candle breathing. There's um, the belly breathing that I was talking about with the little heart. This is the starfish breathing where you trace the hands. Sunshine breathing, I love. It has some movement involved. 
This is using the bubble timer. We'll do that one last. This is the circle breathing. We tried that. And this is one where they do a color search around the room and it brings them into the present moment looking for colors. We'll do this one really quick. You can see, can you tell the viewers what this one is? Can a you lion. A lion with my artwork. So we'll try the lion's breath. And I know it. Ah. You know lion's breath. So take a deep inhale. This one kids love to do, but it's great for adults. It's great if you're a little bit angry or kind of pent up or you need to get some uh, energy out. So you take a big inhale and then you could even make little claws and we're going to take a big exhale and maybe make a little roar and stick your tongue out. So it's like inhale and then you go. <sighs> <laughs> so great. And kids, I like it. Lion's breath. That's always one of their favorite. The lion's I'm all breath. about that one. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we all need a little lion's breath, right? <laughs> yes. So that's what's in the box and it comes in this package and that's all available on my website as well. If you go to corner of the sky, it's under common a box under the drop down common box and you can order with PayPal through the website. And if anyone has any questions, they can reach me through messenger on Facebook or also through the website. There's a link to reach me with questions. We will include the link to your website. Okay. Uh, in the show notes. Oh, that would be beautiful. And your contact information is on your website as well as your Facebook page, right? Yes. Okay. Do you have any questions or comments or? I think your work is wonderful. I know my kids could have used that training, especially the test taking. And I hope that some of our teacher listeners will teach this to their class before tests and just have everyone do it as a practice. That would be amazing. Yeah, that I think be- you're amazing. That is so neat. I hope that gut feeling hits me one day. I have not gotten that gut feeling. So I'm in awe of you, really, that you got it and that you acted on it. A lot of people, that's what they say the difference is. People get it, but it's those who act on it. You know what I mean? So the idea that you did that it's just inspirational. I think that's the key is getting kids into it early so that they know that they have these tools for the rest of their lives. I just think it's great. Oh, I think it's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's, it's quite the passion. Okay. So I have to ask my Virgo questions that aren't really related, but that Virgos usually think that are like outside. The... <laughs> what kind of dancer are you? I was a ballet dancer, but I was also trained in contemporary, a lot of different types of contemporary, but my focus was classical ballet. And I taught classical ballet in point for a while too. And after I graduated, I really just did ballet. Contemporary wasn't really so much my thing. The unfortunate piece for me is that I'm not naturally built like a dancer. I'm a shorter and st- a little stockier. I was always a great jumper, (laughs) uh, but not such a great turner. And I have great natural like turnout and extension, but I don't have long, lean, lovely body, the genetically blessed body, we'll just say. That's what's, again, you're inspirational there because it didn't stop you. I mean, a lot of people, if they don't have that body type, they just don't pursue it. So that's pretty amazing too. Can you tell that might or might not be where my struggles are still as an adult? One of the things that's been really good for me is um, that most yoga studios don't have mirrors and the body image, even as an adult, I think we go back to what that lowest common denominator was as a child. Like it's so easy, our triggers get pushed. And so it's been really beneficial for me to feel the practice in my body and not have to visually make the lines, which I can do, but I get super focused. Now that said, now I'm taking Zoom classes and a lot of times I turn my camera off because I will still get caught. If I see and I'm in a box, I'm like, oh, that arm is a little hot. And it's really what it feels like. It's not what it looks like, but you go back to that. It's so ingrained in me to make the lines proper and 
make the lines look good that I will get hung up in that. So even at 50 plus, you know, we're like a work in progress and it's still like that kindness and compassion to ourselves, and how important that is, you know? So I think there you go again, life is always reminding you all of a sudden now we're on zoom. I got to get reminded again, you know? So we're always going to be a work in progress. I guess when we're not, we're probably dead. (laughs) So my second question is, is your husband amazed at what you did that you quit your job and made this work and all that? I mean, is he proud of that? Let's say, I don't know if he's amazed or amused. (laughs) I think often he's amused by me. The blessing for me is that he is an anchor and he's very stable and he has a very stable career and mindset. He is the yang to my yen or I am the yen to his yang. Like, we are probably complete opposites. He's much more practical and realistic. Did you keep the receipts for that? You know, (laughs) and I'm like, receipts, what? (laughs) Lucy. (laughs) He supported me. He supported you. Yes. 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 He has supported me a lot. Let's just say that many of my gifts are not lucrative gifts. Let's just say (laughs) This is great having you on and sharing those techniques and your product and your website. Amazing. We'd yeah. love to have you back. So Cheryl, did you have anything else? We should wrap no, it up. That's it. I just think it's great. So, well, and I would you. like to have yeah. you on again. So that would oh, be nice. Thank you. thank you so much. It's just been a pleasure. Can you tell it? I have a passion for it. <laughs> yes. No, you were definitely born to do this. Oh, for thank sure. You. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Bye, Cheryl. Bye. Carolyn, Cheryl, thank you. Carolyn, Cheryl, thank you.